And this just is one step further in the wrong direction for the gaming community, and we're gonna pay for it. Seriously, we're gonna pay for it. Hey, welcome back to GT Canada. Today I'm talking about the PlayStation 5 versus the Xbox Series X. Now, a lot of people have done comparisons of the two already, so that's not the point of this video. The point of this video is to tell you what I see from a person who is interested in technology and what history has shown us as far as the console wars go and why I think that you should make the decision to buy a certain console versus a different console. I will get to that at the end, but first I need to back up a little bit and tell you guys some of the details about each console to explain how I arrived at the decision that I did. There is a very important message that this generation of consoles is going to send to the manufacturers specifically about what we want to buy. And so this is a lot more important than just Microsoft versus Sony, Xbox versus PlayStation. This is way bigger than that. And I think we need to group together and send that clear message. But what is the message and why do I feel that that is the message? Let's dive into this. First of all, when we look at the specs, I'm gonna glance through the specs real quickly. I don't think this is an important place to reside and I'll explain that as well. So for now, I only wanna look at the PlayStation 5 and the Xbox Series X. I understand there is a Series S and we will get to that. But for now, we're talking flagship versus flagship. When we look at the price, they're very comparable. $499 for the disc edition, $499 for the Series X. Wonderful. Release date was in within a couple days of each other. Also wonderful. They both support Blu-ray with a 4K drive. Perfect. The RAM is, is the same, 16 gigabytes. The memory bandwidth has a little bit of extra jargon there that in the end, I'm gonna tell you doesn't matter. Now I understand all everyone else out there that love to come and take a dump over what I say on here, Anton, the, you know, 560 gigabytes per second is faster than 448 gigabytes per second, so the Xbox is better. No, that's not what I'm saying. I'm saying that 560 gigabytes per second versus 448 gigabytes per second will make about that much difference to the overall performance of the system. So they're so close that I don't care. That's what I'm saying. The CPU, eight core uh, Zen 2, 3.5 gigahertz versus 3.8 gigahertz, 3.6 with SMT. Again, very similar. When we talk about the GPU, they're both running an AMD graphics card with slightly different performance figures. Back in the day of PlayStation 1 and PlayStation 2, it was always a discussion about performance. Performance, 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 and these numbers mattered. They mattered to everybody. But when you look at the Xbox 360, versus the PlayStation 3, what did we see? The PlayStation 3 on paper was a superior system in every single way. It had more processing power, more cores, more technology. But the 360 was the popular console for many, many, many years through that life cycle. And it was only at the end of the PlayStation 3's life cycle that it finally edged up higher than the 360. I will get into why that was, but just know that it is not always about performance. Another example is the Nintendo Wii, which was basically a GameCube with a motion controller. The GameCube, when it came out, was a low spec system that they thought they would sell based on the gaming experience versus graphics. And that's been Nintendo's philosophy ever since, and it's worked very well for them. Sony and Microsoft are all about the performance, the, the first party games and the core gaming community. So the fact that the Wii was able to do so well when superior gaming systems were out tells us that we don't care about performance 
We care about the experience. And that's why I'm saying that, you know, the GPUs are so close that the experience will be very hard to distinguish a difference, even though the numbers are different. Okay, so, so stay with me on that. So then we talk about the data transfer speeds where the PlayStation 5 is technically faster. Um, the storage space, the PlayStation 5 is notoriously low on storage. If you haven't seen videos or heard about that, you can check out, I got a video over here that talks about the storage and how to expand it and, and all of that. Um, the, place, the Xbox does have a little bit more storage out of the box and they did provide an expandable storage solution right up front, but it is through a proprietary um, SSD, which it limits you. Sony has a, a port that, has, that will be unlocked and allow you to install many different kinds of SSDs, whatever you choose. So there'll be more options on that front. When we look at just straight spec for spec for spec, they're close. Some would argue the Xbox is higher. Some would argue the PlayStation 5 is higher. Why? Because they're keying in on different areas. So I don't think that the specs alone are going to sell the systems. So let's go back to the PlayStation lineup and the evolution of the PlayStation. So we started with the PlayStation 1 in 1994, and then we went to, they released the kind of at the end of the life cycle, they released the PS1, which they always do. It's a slim version that's a little bit smaller that, that kind of gives a last little push in sales before they totally ditch the product line. Then the PlayStation 2 came out in 2000, the PlayStation 3 in 2006, the PlayStation, where are we? The PlayStation 4 in 2013, and then the PlayStation 4 Pro came out in 2016, and then finally the PlayStation 5 in 2020. Did you notice something there? It went PlayStation 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. I have a prediction to make. It is currently 2021. The PlayStation 5 is still brand new. Many people cannot even get their hands on one, but the next PlayStation console will be the PlayStation 6. You heard it here first. The PlayStation 6 is coming. I can guarantee it. You can take that to the bank. Now, let's talk about the Xbox and their console history. Okay, so we have the Xbox One in 2001. Then we have the Xbox 360 in 2005. Then we have a couple iterations of the 360. Um, the Core, the Elite, the Arcade, the 360S, the 360E. Then we went to the Xbox One. Only it's spelled O-N-E, Xbox One. Um, then we have the Xbox One Elite, then we have the Xbox One S, then we have the Xbox One X, and then we have the Xbox One S, all digital, then we have the Xbox Series X, and uh, not on this infographic, there's also the Xbox Series S. If you are not a extreme Xbox I don't want to say fanboy because that has a negative connotation, but if you aren't a connoisseur of the Xbox line, you would have no idea what you're looking at because of this, this numbering sequence. Now, I can tell you, you might already know, but I can tell you why Microsoft has the numbering sequence that they have. See, the Xbox, the original Xbox competed with the PlayStation 2. So when it was time for the PlayStation 3 to come out, Microsoft knew that they could not call it the Xbox 2. Because Xbox 2 doesn't sound as good as PlayStation 3. So an uninformed consumer, when they're at the store and they're going, what should I buy? I can get a PlayStation 3 or an Xbox 2. Well, 3 is better than 2, so I'll buy a 3. Microsoft was very smart. They called it the Xbox 360 because 360 has a lot of the same numbers and feelings as PlayStation 3. So even though it's not the third version of the system, it created the confusion in the market that they were looking for so that someone looking at both systems would consider them both equally. Now at the time, 
Xbox released their stripped down core version, which was cheap. It was very cheap. So when you're looking at a cheap Xbox 360 and it plays all the current gen systems and a PlayStation 3, which was expensive, and it plays all the current gen systems, what do you buy? You buy the Xbox because it's cheaper. It was not as powerful and the specs would say that, but the Xbox 360 sold very well. There was another advantage that Microsoft had back then, which is they actually came to market one year before Sony. So they had a whole year worth of sales and Sony thought they were still riding high on the PlayStation 2 sales. The PlayStation 2 was doing so well, they knew that they were gonna kneecap themselves if they released the PlayStation 3 and it wasn't ready yet anyway. So they rode that coattail for another year, but that gave the PlayStation 3 a very slow start. The thing is, there's so much brand confusion in the Microsoft lineup that when the Xbox Series X and Series S was announced, sales of the Xbox One X and the Xbox One S went through the roof on Amazon because uninformed consumers only paid attention to the last letter and they said, oh, an Xbox S. I just heard that was gonna be released. I didn't even know that was out yet. That's amazing, the PlayStation 5 is not even out yet. I'm gonna get one of these. And they just, sales spiked high and scalpers were even selling them at a markup all of a sudden because people were confused. That confusion is a problem and Microsoft needs to get that under control. They need to stop making it all confusing on purpose to try and generate sales. Why can't they just follow in an order? When you go to buy a cell phone, you buy a Samsung Galaxy S1 or an S2 or an S3 or an S4 or an S8 or an S10 or an S11 and you know that the 11's better than the 10 and the 12's better than both of those. It just, that's how it goes. iPhone's the same way. iPhone skipped a generation. They went from 8 to X because everyone wants to have that X. They want to have that, the, everyone loves an X. And Microsoft loves having a lot of X's the Xbox One X, Series X, whatever, all this stuff. So the other thing that you wanna look at is controllers. Now I've heard it said already that the Xbox Series X will allow you to use any of the previous controllers. And one of the drawbacks of the PlayStation 5 is, as you may have seen in my videos over here, a PlayStation 5 game forces you to use a PlayStation 5 controller. You cannot use a PlayStation 4 controller with a PlayStation 5 game. And a lot of people have, have called that out and said, this is stupid, Sony's trying to do a money grab. Keep in mind, Sony has changed how their controller works, especially with the adaptive triggers. They are trying to immerse you into a gaming system. So not only are they saying, you know, we're pretty powerful, in the sense of what we can handle, but we know that the controller is the interface to that game. So we know that, that your experience is largely driven by that controller. This is something Nintendo has known for a long time and has capitalized on, and Sony is trying to do the same. And those adaptive triggers are really quite the experience. I personally, turn that feature off when I'm playing like Call of Duty and stuff because I don't care how great it feels, I need a competitive advantage. So vibration, the haptic feedback, that gets shut off, the adaptive triggers get shut off, and it's just a core controller. At that point, I wish I could just use my PlayStation 4 controller or my Pro controllers, my Astro controllers, whatever, right? But unfortunately, you can't do that. I understand why Sony did that because they did want to try and push this experience onto people. So even though it's a downfall, it's not the end of the world. So now that we've established that the systems are basically the same, okay, and I, it's a bit of a stretch, I understand, right? But they have the same RAM, roughly the same processor, roughly the same GPU, roughly the same, roughly the same. The, the um, coding environment will be different, the dev kits will, experience will be different, and so on. Let's talk about the Xbox Series S, and we'll also talk about the PlayStation 5 Digital Edition, okay? The Digital Edition PlayStation 5 is exactly the same 
as the PlayStation 5 Disc Edition, with the exception of the optical drive. That is the only difference. In fact, the PlayStation 5, if you open the back cover off of the Disc Edition, the drive is screwed on and it's got a ribbon cable that goes into a port on the PlayStation. If you were to unscrew that drive and unplug that port and put it to the side, you could actually put a digital edition back cover on your disc edition PlayStation 5 and it will be a digital edition at that point. They are exactly the same in every other way. Okay. It's important you understand that because when we look at the Xbox Series S, you'll notice that the price point on that is $299. It's $100 cheaper than the PlayStation 5 Digital Edition. However, it is not the same scenario. The Series S is not the same as the X just without a disk drive. No. It has less RAM. It has 10 gigabytes of RAM versus 16. It has less memory bandwidth. So the speeds that we talked about, you only get 224 gigabytes per second, so it's half the speed, and then two gigabytes at 56 gigabytes per second, which is largely less speed. So it's not capable of passing the texture data to the CPU nearly as fast as what the other two flagship systems can do. It does have the same CPU, which is, which is good, but the GPU, again, is another custom scaled back cut down GPU. And it's, it's quite scaled back, actually. So it's got, it can do four teraflops versus 12 teraflops and 10.28 teraflops. So it's really about a third as powerful as the other two, or two thirds less powerful than the other two. Um, the output is 1440p and it will support 4K through some sort of upscaling. So it can't even handle the full resolution. This will bring me to my point here. The gaming industry does not have the capacity to code different levels of games for different systems. They tolerate that Nintendo puts out less powerful systems and they have forever, they tolerate that. But that also means that Nintendo relies largely on first party games. If you look at the Nintendo games that sell for the, that have the highest sales figures, they're first party games. The third party games are usually not as much they don't put as much time into producing those games or into polishing them up and making them into great games. There are some great games for the Switch. Don't get me wrong. I'm not taking a dump on the Switch. But we all have to agree the Switch is not capable of pumping out the graphics that these next-gen systems can. Right? And usually, a game that's developed for Xbox could be ported to PlayStation 5. And a game that's developed for PlayStation 5 could be ported to Xbox. A secret that is probably not a huge secret, um, in the old days, and I'm, I'm looking more at the PlayStation 3 versus Xbox 360, because the PlayStation 3 was so powerful compared to the Xbox 360, developers actually would create their games on the Xbox 360 and then they would port them to the PlayStation 3. And that's been made clear. Once the PlayStation 3 got hacked, people were able to dig into those file systems and actually prove that that's the case. So I'm not going to pull that all up here. You can call me out in the videos. If you think I'm wrong, tell me where I'm wrong. Cite your source and whatever. I'm not going to go citing sources and whatever. Trust me, I do know a little bit about what I'm talking about. Okay? So... The reason they could do that though was because the cell processor was powerful enough that they had bandwidth to spare. They had processing power to spare. So they could emulate an Xbox within the PlayStation environment and have it run the code that was designed for the Xbox. That allowed them to make one game and have it playable on both systems. What we've got here is a basically an Xbox 
whatever. I don't now see. I don't even know what the stupid Xbox systems are called. So let me see. An Xbox One X Pro is what the Xbox Series S is. It is capable of a little bit more than what the One X is capable of, but it's not capable of what the Series X is capable of. We've forked the game industry again. So we've got the Nintendo Switch over here. We've got the Xbox Series S, kind of, so the Switch, the Series S, and then we've got the Xbox Series X and the PlayStation 5 over here. The gap from the Series S to the X is large enough that developers have two choices. They either make the game compatible with the Series S and then rely on upsampling to run it on the Series X, which means even though the Series X is capable of pumping out amazing graphics, you're actually only gonna get a 1440p video that is upscaled to 4K. You will not, your game will not be made to run at 4K. It just won't. It'll put out 4K to your TV, but it's not actually a 4K game. And a lot of people already are complaining. And I, I see this in the, in the game boards. Um, the message boards, they're talking about Call of Duty Warzone running on the PlayStation 5 and the Xbox Series X. And they say that the Xbox Series X runs Warzone at native 4K at 120 frames per second. And they say that the PlayStation 5 is not running at true 4K. They say it's a, a scaled down version, probably 1440p and that it's capped at 60 frames per second. Now the reason for that is because the game on the PlayStation 5 is not actually a PlayStation 5 game. It's actually a PlayStation 4 game that is running in PlayStation 4 Pro mode on the PlayStation 5. So even though it's a lower resolution that is upscaled to 4K and capped at 60, it actually stays locked at 60 frames per second. There's no dips in the, in the frame rate like you experience on the PlayStation 4 Pro. So it is a better system in that sense. The game just hasn't been updated though. But the complaints that everyone has about Warzone on the PlayStation 5 are the exact same complaints that everybody should have when games coded for the Series S start to come out that are ported to the Series X. The thing that I'm worried about with this is, just like in the old days when an Xbox game was made first and then it was ported to PlayStation 5 or to PlayStation 3 because it had the capacity to do that, I worry that developers that don't have a large studio and do not have the cash or the time or the resources will be making great games, but they will be making them for the Series S and pumping out everything the Series S can do, and then they'll just port it to the Series X and the PlayStation 5. And we will effectively kneecap this entire generation. We will take it out at the knees. We will not get the full performance. The only place where we can expect to get full next-gen performance, and this is what leads me to my ultimate decision here, Microsoft has said, developers, if you are developing on our system, your games must run on the Series S and the Series X. It must run on both. Now I understand, you can have the core of the game set to be a Series X or Series S. You can have it do checks to say what system am I running on. You can even make it access higher resolution graphics if it's on an X versus an S so that you can output proper 4K but still use the same code, the same graphics and the same physics engine, the same all of that while you're still pumping out. But who's gonna do that? It's just so much easier to make it run at 1440p and then upscale to 4K. And there's a, a special tip 
that's going to help that happen better, which I will be dro dropping a video on soon. I can't link it up here. I can't put it in the description because it hasn't come out yet, but it's coming out. So subscribe and hit the bell so that when I tell you about that and tie this all together, it'll make sense to you. Okay. But for now, know that because developers are forced to make it run on both, they will probably take the easy way, which is make it run on the Series S and upscale it for the Series X. Which means if you buy into a Microsoft system, you are saying, I'm okay with Series S performance. The exception to that will be, well, and PlayStation 5 is gonna suffer from that. There's just no, no way around it the PlayStation 5 owners will suffer from that drop in quality that is required on the Xbox side and the lower capacity developers will have no choice but to take the Series S game and port that to the PlayStation 5, which means that this PlayStation 5 will be not putting out the best graphics, not being pushed to its limit. It will just be kind of running along slightly higher than a PlayStation 4 Pro. That's a concern. The place where there is an exception is first party games on the PlayStation 5. Because there is no handicapped system that exists in this generation for Sony, they are capable of stretching every single bit of processing power and graphical power out of the games and push it right to the limit. If a developer does not have to worry about the existence of the Series S while they're developing their game, they're free to push the next-gen consoles to the next-gen level. Because of Microsoft's requirements of games to run on both, a developer would have to choose to only develop for the PlayStation 5 as a PlayStation 5 exclusive, that would be a third-party developer, or a first-party developer would have to be developing just for the PlayStation 5. And this is what leads me to my final message here. And I, I hope you've watched this far to catch this. I say, as a group of gaming enthusiasts, we need to band together and not buy a Microsoft Series S. We need that system to crash and burn. I don't care if you want to buy a Series X. If you support Microsoft, fine. Support Microsoft. Buy a Series X. We need the Series S to be like the ET game from the Atari 2600. If you do not know about that, ET was so horribly bad that the entire world realized it all at once and they boycotted it. And it was so bad, in fact, that they tossed, they couldn't get rid of the games. They couldn't even give it away. Atari eventually ended up putting the game in a landfill. Brand new, pre-packaged games ready to be sold that they couldn't sell. They threw them into a landfill and buried them. That's how trash the game was. It was literally treated as trash. The Series X needs to be seen in that same light. We need to 100% boycott it. Do not buy it. Don't let your mother buy it for you. Don't let your grandma buy it for you. If they do buy it, return it to the store, get your money back, save your allowance, and get a Series X. Send the message clearly to Microsoft that we will not support them forking the next gen gaming system. If this Series S is allowed to gain sales and gain traction, we will send the wrong message to developers that people are interested in a down spec system in order to save money. If you want a down spec system, buy last gen's console and play those games, or buy a Nintendo Switch. Do not support the Series S. I would take it a step further and say, Microsoft, shame on you for even trying to push this crap on us and that we should boycott Microsoft completely 
in this generation and support Sony for realizing that we do want options and I'm okay to take the optical drive out to save some money. Some people don't want it. My children are like, I don't want discs, I just want a digital download. Personally, I like discs, so I bought a disc edition. But Sony, I feel, got it right. They understand the consumers, what we want. They understand how to market that correctly. They are progressing the next generation of gaming, whereas Microsoft is being driven by a board of directors that is more interested in creating market confusion, which has been their plan all along, as I already explained to you, and this just is one step further in the wrong direction for the gaming community, and we're gonna pay for it. Seriously, we're gonna pay for it. Friends don't let friends buy an Xbox Series S. That's the bottom line. If you're watching this video and you agree Share this video with your friends. Say, hey, you got to watch this. Share it with your Xbox buddies. Share it with your PlayStation buddies. They need to see what's in this video so that they can make an informed decision. And once they make the informed decision, if you find out that they bought an Xbox Series S, unfriend them on Facebook, unfollow them on Twitter, delete them from the Snapchat, Cut them out of your life. They are a moron. They're making bad choices and those bad choices will affect you too. The day of them buying a crappy system, putting it at home and thinking that it doesn't affect anyone, that day is over. Today, we need to stand together as a gaming community. Send the clear message which way we want this industry to go and make sure that they understand clearly loud and clear that we will not stand for this. I hope that I was able to properly convey all of my points to you guys today. I, I understand there's a lot here. I tried to explain it in a way that everyone can understand. I also understand that the hardcore guys are going to be like, Anton, you missed this. You forgot, forgot about that. Whatever. There's, I'm sure there's things that I could add to this to make it more complete. The message should still be heard the same way. And I hope that you did hear that. I hope you enjoyed this video. Subscribe down below so you can come back next time. Don't forget to check out some of our other videos over here. We do have a lot of great content on this channel and I think that you will enjoy it. We do hope to see you again, but until next time, have a great day.